After Locofocos, or early libertarians in New York, clamored together to agitate for a new state constitution that would democratize the process of incorporating businesses, American economic history entered a revolutionary phase. For Locofocos, it was a blindingly bright accomplishment, but in hindsight, it was yet another troublesome compromise. By now, corporations are so commonplace, so ubiquitous, and considered so necessary that we barely stop to ask whether it's ever been justifiable in the first place. Well, here to help me tackle one of the great relatively forgotten questions in libertarian history is Gary Chartier. He has a PhD in philosophy from Cambridge, he teaches law and business ethics at California's La Sierra University, and he's been one of the country's leading left libertarian thinkers for some time now. Welcome to Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. So I think you uh, you have a particularly interesting sort of personal history of intellectual influence and change over time. Um, could you, Gary Chartier, give us your how I became a libertarian story? You know, I think like a lot of uh, libertarians of my age, I'm 51. I grew up with uh, Goldwater Wright parents. I programmed computers. I read science fiction, and I was socially awkward. So uh, it was a really, it was in in some ways a pretty natural progression. Uh, I found myself radicalizing uh, the views that uh, that my parents had, uh, moving from. Their position, which was in many ways uh, pretty conventionally conservative Republican, with with a few interesting exceptions, and so I'd end up embracing I'd ended up embracing libertarian views by the time I was, say, fourteen or fifteen, fourteen probably, and I had kind of started down the path toward being a fairly uh, fairly radical libertarian, and then I got as it were, sidetracked in college, uh, as I think probably happens to a lot of people. I encountered issues in college that I hadn't really thought about uh, sufficiently, uh, issues having to do with poverty and social inequity of various kinds. And that sent me down uh, a detour in the direction of what was in many respects probably fairly conventional social democratic politics of the kind you might associate with a lot of people in academia. What really, I think, largely re-radicalized me uh, was the one-two punch of George W. Bush and Barack Obama, uh, two, uh, two uh, amazing guys who, who showed me just how awful uh, the state could be in, uh, in different ways, uh, and their support for uh, the warfare state, their commitment to uh, corporate privilege, uh, and so forth. These things uh, really prompted a great deal of cynicism on my part and led me ultimately to discover the work of libertarians like Roderick Long and Kevin Carson, and as a result, to discover that there was a way in which my uh, early commitment to libertarianism could be reinvigorated in tandem with a, uh, I think, much richer and more thoughtful uh, responsiveness to a range of social problems. And so I could come home, and yet, of course, not just come home, but come home now to a strand of libertarianism that I had been, at best, uh, you know, pretty minimally aware of. Uh, the, the uh, you know sort of modern descendants of Benjamin Tucker and Lysander Spooner and the 19th century individualist anarchists who uh, really, as I discovered, were up to really fascinating things and uh, whose uh, ideas continued to thrive and flourish in the very capable hands of people like Roderick and Kevin and Charles Johnson and Sheldon Richmond and others. So it was a, I took a long detour and came home. I think that's the short answer. And you call yourself a left libertarian? Uh, I do, at least in context in which that's helpful. 
Uh, You know, if you read the Wikipedia article, left libertarianism, you find that there are at least three different, rather different meanings of that term, uh, including anarcho-communism, the sort of neo-Georgist position that might be associated with Steiner and Valentine and Suka, and then the uh, kind of view that we uh, would be inclined to embrace. And so uh, sometimes it's helpful to talk about left libertarianism. Uh, Sometimes it's probably more useful to spell things out in more detail. Sometimes I'll use the term left-wing market anarchism, but uh, it, uh, I think context is everything. Well, what exactly is the left part of that then? What do you see as sort of the, you know, the, the leftist element in this kind of libertarianism that you ascribe to, which we'll, we'll dig into a little more here soon? Yeah, so that's a great question. Obviously, there's no platonic universal that is the left. And uh, we find uh, in different contexts uh, quite different uh, meanings associated with that expression. Uh, As a lot of libertarians will know, uh, the uh, uh, origins of the left-right distinction seem to have to do with where people sat in parliament. But uh, clearly that's a that's a different uh, a different world than the one we're in now. I guess the, I guess the French problem, particularly. So, you know, there you might have thought that the basic left-right distinction was one between the friends of the king and the enemies of the king, the friends of uh, of uh, freedom and uh, social equality, and the opponents of and the friends of uh, of authority. And there's something to that. I guess when I've tried to spell out what I have in mind in talking about the left, I tend to think of what I regard as the best elements of the new left in the 60s, which obviously had itself a variety of libertarian elements, and so I've probably stacked the deck by going in that direction. But I tend to think about um, opposition to exclusion, subordination, deprivation, and war. And obviously, there, you know, that needs to be spelled out in a lot more detail. Uh, and obviously, there's overlap with a variety of other positions there. But when I think about the left, I'm thinking, therefore, about, a, a, a broadly speaking, a family of positions committed uh, to social inclusion, unhappy with hierarchy, uh, in favor, therefore, of empowerment, and, uh, and again, very much opposed to violence as a, as a means of, uh, of solving social problems. I think in today's context, one of the major monkey wrenches in a system like that is the corporation. Now, this is this is an institution that libertarians have been attacking for centuries now, uh, even though we might forget that in, in today, uh, today's intellectual paradigm of libertarianism. There, there really is not much space for a left libertarian critique of the corporation. Although it's been around forever, for hundreds and hundreds of years, libertarians have been talking about the problems with corporations. So I asked you here to, to help me tackle this issue of libertarianism's corporation problem. I remember several years ago when I was a young Austro-libertarian student, I was going to one of the year's more popular uh, education events, and um, you know that people on a circuit always are sure to stop here too. And two of my favorite historians were there giving sort of a joint session on, I don't know, something like problems in the 19th century. It was about American history. And I asked them, um, you know, I was beginning my own honors thesis as an undergrad working on William Leggett, one of these early loco focos and critics of corporations. And I, I was curious about why did people like William Leggett and these radical Jacksonians, why did they hate corporations so much? And they thought they were monopolies and all this. You know, I, I asked them, both of these historians, why did these people hate corporations so much? And they basically shrugged their shoulders. They had no idea. They said they, they didn't know what to tell me. Um, and I was hugely disappointed. I walked away from that event thinking, you know, these purported experts have overlooked one of the major questions in the history of their own movement. I, I just could not understand that. So then I spent my time in graduate school trying to answer the question, and I, I came to the history of locofocoism. So now I want to ask you, uh, can you briefly tell us what, what is the issue that historical libertarians or classical liberals what is their issue against incorporation? I think it's great that you emphasize that we're talking about a libertarian heritage of criticism of corporate power and quite possibly the corporate form that go back uh, several centuries. I think 
modern American libertarians often have a kind of historical tunnel vision in virtue of which uh, libertarianism really somehow emerges, uh, I don't know, post-World War II with a split between Murray Rothbard and, and the uh, uh, folks around Bill Buckley. And clearly, there's a much, much richer heritage there. Uh, later libertarianism, uh, because of, I think, some historical accidents associated with the Cold War, has tended to be identified with the right. Uh, but the classical liberal and libertarian tradition includes a whole lot of anti-status quo politics over many centuries that certainly feels much more leftish to me. So it's perhaps not altogether surprising that there's been this concern about the corporation. Um, and that's because it seems as if, first of all, the corporation has been a locus of state secured privilege. Uh, the corporation has been a particularly visible example of the uh, business entity or business association that secures and uh, obtains a variety of cartelizing privileges and subsidies and so forth. Uh, that's certainly true in particular with regard to the corporate form itself and uh, certainly the associated important feature of uh, limited liability. So uh, there's at least an interesting argument about the degree to which entity status, uh, the uh, idea that the corporation exists in an important way uh, separately from all those who are involved, whether that could be itself established by contract. But if it could be established by contract, as many libertarians have suggested, there's obviously the uh, problem that what the state's done has been to artificially uh, reduce transaction costs and make it at any rate much easier for people to simply opt into that form rather than to do so uh, perhaps with uh, negotiation and with alternatives on the table as they would if it weren't uh, sort of pre-available. Uh, pre uh, in virtue of uh, general corporation statutes. There's also separately uh, the problem of limited liability, which clearly has been a, uh, a persistent concern, right? So we have, uh, of course, two kinds of limited liability, limited liability in contract and limited liability in tort. And so limited liability in contract, you might think, um, would be relatively easy to establish by contract. But again, if you did that, you would still have to negotiate and uh, there still would be alternatives on the table and uh, those transaction costs would have to be taken into account. Limited liability in tort, of course, is a, uh, and, I, and I should say just to back up for, for folks who, uh, who aren't legal geeks, we talk about limited liability. The idea is that in a lawsuit, whether in contract or tort, the corporation's assets are at stake, but not the assets of the shareholders, the, the, the assets of the shareholders that are not uh, themselves uh, directly part of the corporation. So uh, obviously this serves as a real incentive for people to invest in a corporation uh, because they know that while they may lose uh, their investment, their own, uh, their own personal assets won't be at stake. At any rate, so limited liability in tort uh, clearly is another matter entirely uh, because here, so su suppose for instance we're talking about a case in which uh, the corporation uh, poisons the groundwater and uh, causes a bunch of people around a manufacturing plant to, uh, you know, to get cancer. Uh, so here we have a situation in which uh, those people don't have uh, in general any kind of prior contractual relationship with the corporation so they can't agree by contract to limit uh, uh, any uh, suits in which they might engage to one's concern just with the assets of the corporation as a whole. Uh, so you might think uh, if the shareholders really are owners, why wouldn't they themselves uh, be in one way or another liable for the, uh, uh, the debts of the corporation? So if the corporation becomes liable because of, uh, say, this instance where it's uh, polluted the groundwater, uh, why stop the assets of the corporation itself? So again, there are arguments to be had about that, but uh, the point again is that uh, the law simply solves that problem uh, on behalf of the corporation uh, without uh, uh, allowing for uh, perhaps the kind of flexibility and uh, the kind of potential risk that would have to be sorted out more carefully.
Um, so you've got these features of the corporate form itself that I think uh, many libertarians have rightly seen as, uh, as statist. And then there's just the fact that the corporation, once it exists, uh, quickly becomes a locus, as I say, of state secured privilege in various ways. And uh, uh, the corporation can become a means of concentrating wealth that then uh, can be uh, wealth that can then be used to, uh, in one way or another, pursue uh, gimmies uh, from the political process. So all of those things, I think, have troubled people over time. Now, Alexis de Tocqueville famously wrote about associationism in America, especially the power of people just simply associating with each other on a voluntary basis in basically clubs whose purpose would be to do a certain thing, like build a school in the town. Um, you know, they would get together and form a uh, town school association that uh, would, you know, have the goal of building a school within a few months. And then they would go ahead and do that. And meanwhile, in Paris, uh, you would have to petition the, you know, bureaucrat uh, in charge of education to eventually come to your town out in the countryside and build a school, and it would take years. Um, so de Tocqueville said, well, this American pattern of associationism is really incredibly efficient, and it explains you know, a large part of their democratic culture. Um, it's reflective of their democratic culture, and it helps produce this amazingly prosperous condition that they enjoy. You know, how, how is the incorporation any different from an association? Is it simply that corporations are associations with, you know, monopolies or privileges attached to them? So what seems clear is that um, de Tocqueville's cheering for associations can't have been um, in any straightforward way cheering for corporations because certainly many, probably almost all at the time he wrote of the American associations uh, that uh, performed these various uh, uh, civic goods obviously weren't incorporated. So clearly incorporation wasn't uh, crucial for that. And the corporate form uh, was certainly uh, apparent in societies like England's uh, where uh, the same level of uh, associational freedom and associational vitality weren't evident. So I think it's, it's pretty important to, to treat those as distinct. Um, associations obviously are, are wonderful, and that's something that uh, any free society is going to depend on, the ability of people to form and reform a variety of free associations. But when the association um, acquires uh, just straightforwardly as a result of state privilege, um, entity status so that it's no longer just the people involved, but it now has some kind of independent existence when it can then go on uh, to uh, hold assets and to uh, avoid liabilities uh, in ways that depend on its having that, uh, that entity status. And, uh, and that certainly when it becomes a, a pressure group in search of uh, long-term privileges, um, whether we want to say that makes it a, uh, something that's qualitatively different from de Tocqueville's associations or whether you want to say, no, this is really just a special kind of association. I'm not sure much turns on that, but what's clear is that the additions uh, are troubling in a way that the associational form itself is not. You know, I, I'm wondering why, why did so many liberal or you know, radical uh, thinkers who were anti-corporate over the centuries – uh, why did they so closely link the idea of monopoly and corporation? I mean, plainly, you know, it was possible for uh, uh, s smaller people, I suppose, <laughs> people who are not at the very top of the power elite. Uh, it's possible for them to open corporations, especially, like you said, in an environment like the U.S. or Britain uh, as time went on in the 19th century. Um, but yet there was still this linkage of the idea of monopoly, like, like uh, you know, some... Um, medieval king granting out monopoly privileges to some special toadies of his to go do the mining in this region or to go conquer some territory in America and then you own it all. Um, and the idea of corporation, people pulling their capital toward a particular business venture. Why, why was there such a strong linkage for so long? So you're the historian and I, and I suspect really uh, could answer the question better than I can, but I have the sense that um, the fact that for so long uh, the corporation was a special creation of the state 
made a huge difference here. So, of course, first of all, for, for a very long time, the only entities that were described as corporations were state entities, uh, you know, so that a city, uh, you know, might qualify, for instance, as a corporation. So then you have kings extending uh, this privilege uh, of uh, special status to favored uh, uh, favored groups. Well, uh, I think it's I think it's unsurprising that these favored groups uh, didn't just uh, want to petition, let's say, for for entity status or even for limited liability. Um, they were at the same time getting special monopoly grants, and so I think it would have it would have been quite natural uh, for the king to grant a corporate charter uh, that came with. A set of monopoly privileges, and so because of that, then uh, I think uh, it would have been very clear to people over an extended period that when um, a, uh, a corporate charter is granted by the royal authorities, uh, this isn't uh, just a kind of innocent inducement to business activity, but it really is intended precisely to confer on the king's cronies a. Uh, a kind of privilege that, that clearly otherwise wouldn't have been available. And so then when you move to general incorporation statutes, obviously some of that element of cronyism uh, goes away because the charter isn't just handed out uh, you know, on, a, on an arbitrary discretionary basis to the king's cronies. But at the same time, um, you know, people are very much aware that when, uh, uh, when business people uh, pool their resources in uh, an entity that uh, is separate from themselves and that therefore can give them a certain kind of insulation uh, against uh, poor choices, uh, that in, in various ways uh, they're going to be incentivized to engage in bad behavior and they may well engage in uh, utilizing the wealth they've pooled to, uh, to seek privileges in one way or another in the state. So I think, you know, there's certainly been a progression then in the history of the corporation, but it seems to me that uh, the early history set the tone and the fact that uh, uh, that early history was in the backdrop would understandably have made people suspicious and the continuing mischief making uh, engaged in by, by corporations even after general corporation um, certainly would have encouraged uh, that kind of uh, suspicion on the part of the public and certainly on the part of the vegetarian critics. Now, as I've covered on the show before, the the uh, triumph of general incorporation state by state, it happened in constitutional conventions, and it started really with New York in 1846 and the, the Loco Foco movement to reform that state. Um, and the, the corporation process was at the very top of their list, and it was one of the things they were most effective in changing. Um, they helped democratize the institution by, you know, generalizing who could actually get a corporation set up and how it happened, um, and it extended limited liability to all sorts of different uh, corporate activities. And far, far more people than ever before could now incorporate their business. And there's this explosion of of new charters in the late 1840s and throughout the 1850s, and corporations just are everywhere at at that point. Uh, it's not just railroads and bridges and you know steamboat companies and stuff like that. It's it's all sorts of things become incorporated, so that by the time we get to today, uh, you know, 150, 60 years later, corporations are everywhere. They're ubiquitous. They're considered totally necessary, proper. They're rarely questioned as a good thing, and you know, even we libertarians, whose history is built on this, we forget that it was ever a question whether these are justifiable institutions in the first place. You know, so I, I'd like for us to try to tackle some of the critiques of, of the anti-corporate left libertarian point of view here. You know, are we just a couple of modern day Luddites here uh, arguing about something that is clearly a benefit? So, uh, no, I, I think we're not. Uh, that's a short answer. It seems to me that the um, Given the alternative, the alternative that uh, uh, there would be uh, specially privileged entities created by uh, legislative acts and uh, entitled to uh, uh, really unique legal positions, uh, the push by the local focus for general incorporation uh, certainly seems like a breath of fresh air and indeed an instance of, as you say, democratization. I think 
it's interesting to wonder what uh, uh, what the Lokofokos might have said um, had the risk of uh, special incorporation not been on the table, what kinds of arrangements they would then have favored uh, if they hadn't had to counter uh, that other possibility. And so um, while they certainly sought uh, in, uh, in pressing for the changes they did to level the playing field, uh, clearly uh, a more level playing field would be established in a case in which uh, really the uh, uh, issues would have to be sorted out uh, by contract and by common law court decisions, uh, and there wouldn't be any possibility of, uh, of state intervention. So, um, yeah, I don't think we're I don't think we're luddites to think that the uh, the general incorporation statutes, even if dramatic improvements on what preceded them, uh, still in one way or another unnecessarily reduced transaction costs and unnecessarily reduced risks, while probably at the same time encouraging uh, wealth concentration in the hands of, uh, of corporations and, uh, you know, thus, you know, perpetuating some problems. So I, I don't want to at all be dismissive of the positive step that uh, the the local focus took, but I think I think we can I think we can do better over time. Mm -hmm. Now, is it is it true that you're simply a rabid social justice warrior who wants to be able to strip or review corporate charters whenever you feel like they're doing something wrong? You know, maybe maybe take away a company's charter if they host Jordan Peterson or something. Um, you know, that thought hadn't actually occurred to me. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, I'm just not interested in playing those games. I'm certainly not interested, I think, in any uh, legal arrangement that lets courts or legislatures or executives, uh, that lets any entity, whether in a, in a stateful or a stateless society, uh, just arbitrarily, uh, willy-nilly uh, fiddle with uh, the legal status of individual entities. My, my preference is uh, that we sunset the uh, the corporate form entirely and uh, uh, let people uh, craft arrangements uh, you know through through contract and through argument in in courts about you know where to draw lines for instance with regard to shareholder liability that uh, really uh, can be reflective of uh, uh, how things uh, you know can turn out in the absence of state uh, transaction saving cost saving measures. I'm wondering then, how exactly would that work? Do you think, uh, especially in today's climate where there are so many, you know, potentially disruptive new technologies out there, either underway right now, being developed right now, in production and in distribution at the moment, something like uh, the Bitcoin distributed ledger that's in action, and that could dramatically transform the way we do contracts. Uh, how do you think some of these these things would work? How would people pool their capital together and limit their liabilities for actions taken by a gigantic corporation? You know, something like Uber that you know is potentially responsible for all sorts of liability. Why would why would people invest their money in in an operation like that that is untested, charting new waters every day, trying new things, um, and there's so much risk in that? Why why do that if you can't? Uh, use the force of government to protect your investment? Yeah, so it seems to me that uh, if you're thinking about uh, yeah, the kind of risky environment that, that we're in now, it certainly makes sense to ask the question, as, as courts I think are perfectly capable of doing, um, am I a passive investor or Am I simply pretending to be a passive investor to shield myself from liability when, in fact, I, uh, uh, you know, really am uh, more influential over corporate decisions than I than I perhaps like to advertise? You know, and we know. So again, this is all about uh, the transaction cost issue again. I think we know that um, you know, court can, uh, as the expression goes, pierce the corporate veil uh, in particular cases when. Uh, it does seem as if uh, limited liability and, and entity status are being used to uh, shield uh, bad actors against liability for their mischief making even now. So it's not as if that's somehow impossible now. It's just that uh, the uh, uh, pre-existing uh, corporate form and corporate protections uh, make that harder. So I think the flip side is certainly true that, 
uh, you know, you might well expect common law courts uh, to begin with the assumption that truly passive investors in, in publicly traded corporations uh, really did operate at, a, at enough of a distance from corporate decision making that they might, uh, uh, you know, not be responsible, not because of any general principle of limited corporate liability, but because uh, their role is really not that of owners, despite the language that's often used. I mean, really, they're, uh, they're you know, not that different, perhaps, say, from banks lending money uh, you know, to, to corporations just that they have, have variable returns. And you were going to say something. What, I wonder about that because, you know, that seems to me a little like saying, oh, Northerners had nothing to do with slavery. They were just, you know, <laughs> funding the slave trade and, and, you know, sailing the ships and things like that. You know, I, I'm not so sure that you can be a passive investor in a company. So that's an interesting, uh, an interesting possibility. Um, I think one can, one can ask the question, I guess, in the case of a, uh, in the case of the investor, how much control does that, does that investor have? I think that it seems to me that's a factual about the extent of influence that the, the that the investor potentially has, you know, uh, and then one can ask the question: If the investor has a certain amount of, of influence, uh, do the investor seek to uh, to exercise that influence? Um, and I do think, again, uh, unavoidably, the courts uh, would find themselves engaged in factual inquiries about that. Um, so, how precisely? Um, they would draw those lines. Uh, I'm not sure, right? I just think that uh, unavoidably courts would find themselves engaged in the kind of thinking that, you know, probably common law courts did to, to some degree in the 19th century, asking, uh, are we going to stifle uh, productive investment from which we all benefit if we assume that any and all investors uh, who are arm's length investors are, are fully liable? And so maybe you, want to, maybe you want to respond, no, there are so many bad things that uh, the corporations might do that uh, it really is worth holding the sort of Damocles over the, uh, you know, over the heads of individual investors. You might think, however, in those cases, uh, I can imagine that there would be insurance arrangements that probably would be uh, – uh, probably would be invoked in one way or another to provide to, uh, provide shielding there. I'd have to stop and think about the economics of such arrangements. But I think that the bottom line is a corporation that wanted to attract uh, investment from anonymous members of the general public would, it seems to me, need to provide uh, some kind of security there. You couldn't just assume in advance, uh, I suppose, that a, that a court would rule in a certain way. And so, yeah, perhaps in that case, what you'd need to do would be to say, if you choose to invest here, uh, you know, uh, recognize that the value of your shares is uh, constrained by the fact that we do have to keep paying paying for this, you know, liability insurance for you. If you want to buy in, that's a, you know, that's a possibility. And so that might, you know, there might be a certain kind of self-regulating mechanism there. Um, yeah, I mean, we'd, we'd have to talk more about the institutional arrangements, but that's uh, uh, I'm fumbling. Well, now this this leads me back to an earlier thread. I'm wondering again, then, what happened in the 20th century for libertarians to stop concerning themselves very much with the the question of uh, corporations? You know, is is Ayn Rand to blame uh, for making us love and respect <laughs> business people so much and their great bigness uh, as entrepreneurs? Or, you know, is is it really the fault of, I guess, the Cold War, um, which just sort of automatically identified everything with the smacking of the left with communism and libertarians can't have that, so, you know, we're on the right. What really happened here, or is it something maybe more sinister that that we also have had our interests, material interests, in the corporate form? Yeah, so I think great questions. It seems to me, as uh, I observed before, it really seems to me that the um, post World War II uh, identification of American libertarianism uh, with the corporate sector is an anomaly. It seems pretty clear that uh, there wasn't much enthusiasm uh, for big business on the part of the so-called old right, and certainly uh, not on the part of 19th century 
and earlier, uh, you know, libertarians and classical liberals. It seems to me this was uh, this is really a really this anomalous uh, feature of uh, the uh, unstable alliance between uh, the uh, Cold War Buckley right and uh, and uh, you know, libertarians like. Uh, like Rothbard and Frank Meyer. So I think that uh, political background uh, undoubtedly matters, uh, the sense that somehow the enemy of my enemy is my friend, which is I think almost always a bad basis for decision making. Uh, I think Rand, uh, Rand surely has to bear some blame here for uh, telling us that big business is America's persecuted minority. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, Rand herself at her best certainly knew how to paint pictures of business people who were anything but members of the persecuted minority and certainly knew how to manipulate the system. But by saying things like that, um, uh, she certainly did encourage a kind of moral blindness, I think, on the part of, uh, of a number of libertarians who came of age in the, you know, the 50s and 60s with regard to uh, the, the merits of uh, uh, not only the corporate form in the narrow sense, but sort of the role that uh, the large corporations played in uh, American social and political life. Um, you know, whether there's also on top of that, um, you know, an unwillingness to face some of these problems because of our own uh, economic interests. I mean, look, I think we always have to be aware of those kinds of possibilities. Um, and... Uh, Right. So, I mean, I teach at a university and undoubtedly some money that the university uh, possesses, it possesses because some corporation donated it. Um, I, I find myself, uh, you know, sometimes willing to uh, uh, roll my eyes at uh, criticisms by the status left, let's say, of, uh, of Charles Koch. Uh, is that because I get, you know, a tiny uh, grant from the Koch Foundation to run lectures? Maybe. Um, I think we should be aware of that kind of thing. But I think there are all sorts of libertarians who don't have much, if anything, to do with uh, with corporate money. And even those who do in one way or another receive corporate grants or benefit from corporate largesse, um, you know, are not, I think, as a general matter, uh, just uh, unprincipled shills. Uh, of course, you might expect me to say that. But uh, yeah, I don't. I, I think it's. I think it's more this broader cultural thing that uh, really starts after the war, and that I think does include both the uh, the Cold War right libertarian alliance, and, and certainly the influence of Rand with her vision of corporate titans as heroic, and uh, probably the way in which that influenced the, the self understanding of, uh, of a number of people after that. A special thanks to Professor Gary Chartier for joining me on the show today to talk about libertarianism's corporation problem. It may be too much to ask that you all come away from this, a bunch of rabid anti-corporate loco focos, but I hope that it has at least provoked a new and fresh set of serious questions in your minds. The loco focos were among the first generations who actually had to deal with the corporation problem as it was taking shape. They played a serious role in determining how corporations would look for the next two centuries. But today, we stand in our own swirling era of constant reform. We cannot afford to make the same mistakes they did. Liberty Chronicles is a project of libertarianism.org. It is produced by Tess Terrible. If you've enjoyed this episode of Liberty Chronicles, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. For more information on Liberty Chronicles, visit libertarianism.org.